Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, at the start, I, I first of all also would like to really like to thank uh, Carla and her team for putting together this event. Uh, uh, I think it's really exciting that that uh, in these difficult times that we nevertheless through this format are, are able to have such an exciting time uh, together. So uh, thanks a lot, Carla, for this. It's, it's really uh, fantastic. Um, so my talk this morning, uh, in a way, is a very natural continuation of what Robin Santra was talking about uh, yesterday afternoon. So Robin talked to us uh, about several ways that uh, the degree of co coherence is determined in autosecond experiments. Uh, and what I would like to talk about in my talk this morning is particularly the, the role of entanglement in determining the coherence that we encounter in autosecond experiments. Um, so here's a summary of my talk. Uh, so uh, the main point that I want to discuss with you, or what I'm going to try to convince you of, is that in autosecond science, we encounter, in a way, complementary roles of entanglement and coherence. Now, you know, of course, in order to understand this statement, we first have to uh, be a little bit more precise about what we mean with entanglement and what we mean with coherence. So let's start with coherence. Uh, and there, of course, we have to realize, I hope we all uh, uh, do already, uh, that any time-resolved experiment, any probe experiment that we do in our laboratories, of course, relies on the fact that there are well-defined phase relationships between different component states that together form a coherent superposition, that together form a wave packet that we are probing in our experiment. Of course, in autosecond science, we encounter this everywhere. We encounter this the moment that we are talking about electronic wave packets that are involved in charge migration processes. Uh, we encounter this uh, in nuclear wave packets when we consider the dissociation of a vibration or the vibration of a molecule. Really, the, the, the key element that makes our pump probe experiment uh, possible always is the existence of uh, coherence in the experiment. Now, uh, in other second experiments, uh, uh, coherence is potentially compromised. And this has to do with the fact that uh, autosecond radiation, so the autosecond pulses that we generate by means of high harmonic generation, are by definition ionizing radiation. Uh, autosecond pulses that we generate uh, have photon energies in the extreme ultraviolet or even in the soft X-ray regime. And for any atom, molecule, even for condensed phase systems that we use, this represents ionizing radiation. This is radiation that can split the system into an ion and a photoelectron. And what I'm going to try to convince you of is that more often than not, uh, there is going to be an entanglement between these ions and these photoelectrons. And this entanglement limits the coherence that we can observe when in our uh, autosecond experiment, when we choose at dynamics that is taking place in the ion or when we choose to take uh, to look at dynamics that is taking place in the photoelectron. And we're going to try to illustrate this point uh, in two ways. Uh, one is I'm briefly going to talk about an experiment that we already did uh, quite a few years ago, where we first encountered this. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about a numerical experiment that I performed uh, recently uh, that also uh, illustrates this point. So let's start with the experiment. Uh, this was, uh, at the time, actually the first autosecond pump probe experiment on a molecular system uh, that we performed in the laboratory of uh, Mauro and Misoli in, uh, in Milano. Uh, and it was a classic XUV plus IR pump probe experiment where we used an autosecond pulse to ionize the hydrogen molecule that basically then led to production of H2 plus in the two lowest electronic states of the molecular ion. So either the bound uh, 1 sigma G state or the repulsive, uh, therefore unbound 2P sigma U state. And at a variable time delay, we came in with a, a few cycle IR probe laser, and then that resulted in the production of H plus ions that were measured on a velocity map imaging detector. So this velocity map imaging detector basically means that we projected the ions on a 2D detector, and the position where we measure the ions on this detector basically has the meaning of velocity. So that basically means that in the experiment, uh, we had access both to the actual velocity of the ions, their kinetic energy, uh, as, as well as their direction of emission with respect to the laser polarization axis, which actually is the vertical axis in the image that you see here. Now, the observable that we chose to focus on in this experiment was uh, so-called electron localization. Basically, 
uh, the difference in the tendency for the H plus ion that is formed in the, H, the dissociation of H2 plus, of course, we form an H plus and we form a neutral H atom. Basically, the tendency of the H plus that is formed here to preferentially fly up or down uh, along the laser polarization axis. So that is expressed in the asymmetry parameter that you see plotted here, which is basically the normalized difference between the probabilities for the H plus to fly up or down along the laser polarization axis. Now, there's several things that you see in this experimental result. First of all, you see that this asymmetry parameter isn't necessarily zero, so there is a preferential direction up or down. And moreover, we see that this preferential direction depends on the energy, the kinetic energy of the H+, and most interestingly, it depends on the time delay between the other second pulse and the few cycle IR pulse. And in fact, we see the, we see the asymmetry oscillating back and forth as a function of time delay. So if we shift the time delay by half an optical period, we shift the preference from up to down or the other way around. Um, now, first question is, why is this an experiment that tells us something about coherence in the H2 plus ion? Uh, in order to appreciate this, what I'm trying to convince you of is that electron localization is in fact a manifestation of coherence. Uh, why is that so? Well, the reason that this is so is that there is a way that we can write the, way, the electronic wave functions that uh, belong to the, the, the 1s sigma g and the 2p sigma u uh, states. And basically, both of them we can write as linear combination of atomic wave functions. The precise nature of these atomic wave functions is not important for now. Yeah, but we can write them as a linear combination of uh, atomic wave functions where the, where the single bound electron that we have in the H2 plus is located on the left or on the right proton that we have in the H2 plus. Uh, and then the difference between the 1s sigma g and the 2p sigma u is simply whether we have this linear combination with a plus or a minus sign. The plus sign, of course, uh, indicates that there's a finite electron density between the two protons. That's why it's a bonding orbital. The minus sign indicates that there's a node between the two protons. That is why this is a repulsive state. Now, of course, we can easily rewrite this, and then we can see what it means for us to find the electron on the left or the right in our H2 plus ion. And of course, the moment that we see an electron on the left, that means that we are going to detect an H plus on the right and vice versa. And so we basically see that in order to have the electron preferentially on the left or on the right in our H2 plus, we somehow must have put uh, the molecule into a coherent superposition of the gerade and the ungerade state. We must have broken the parity of the ionic wave function uh, so that the ionic wave function is a coherent superposition of gerade and ungerade. So that is why this electron localization really measures for us the electronic coherence that we have in the ion. Okay, that's all fine and good, but why is this then an experiment that is sensitive to entanglement? Now, in order to appreciate that, uh, I am writing down this form for, as, a, as a general uh, way to describe the ion plus photoelectron wave function that we have in the H2 plus plus electron system. So basically, you see that there's two choices that we can make here. It's a little bit of simplified notation, of course. And so the first choice that we need to make is that we're going to produce an ion that is in the 1s sigma g, so in the gerade state, or that is in the 2p sigma u, the ungerade state. And then in addition, what I'm distinguishing here is that there is an accompanying photoelectron. And also this photoelectron has a parity. If the angular momentum of the photoelectron is even, then the parity is gerade. If the angular momentum of the electron is odd, then it's going to be ungerade. And so that basically means that I have four combinations of ionic states and photoelectron states, depending on whether the parities are gerade and ungerade. Of course, if the parity of both the ion and the electron are gerade, then the overall wave function is gerade, and so and so forth. Um, so this general form of the uh, wave function in simplified notation already tells us that we are that it's rather likely that we are going to encounter entanglement. Because after all, what does entanglement mean? Entanglement means that we are unable to write uh, the wave function of our two component system as a single product of uh, a wave function for the one part and a wave function for the other part. What we see here in our H2 plus photoelectron system is that we potentially have four of these products that play a role in the experiment. And, and the moment that we have more than one, we have an entangled system. 
Okay, now let's return to the electron localization and let's use the expressions that we had on the previous slide for the, for the wave function corresponding to the electron being left on the left or on the right. Let's introduce these in these uh, expressions. That's of course easy to do. Uh, so um, what I've done here now is simply replace Psi G and Psi U by the expressions that we had on the previous slide for Psi left and, and Psi right. Now in doing that, uh, we can <clears throat> come up with expressions for the probability that in our experiment, we are going to find the electron on the right or on the left. That's of course very easy to do. We just collect the amplitudes that correspond to, to left or right and take the absolute value squared. And so that basically leads to these two expressions for the probability to find the electron on the left or the, uh, on the right. Um, and we basically see that, that all four of these coefficients play a role in this. The only difference between the two expressions is that um, uh, on the left side, we have two of these amplitudes combining with a plus sign. On the right side, we have two of these amplitudes combining uh, with a minus sign. Okay, now let's consider what we do when we ionize a neutral H2 molecule uh, with an XUV photon. I mean, this is a process that is subject to a dipole selection rule. And this dipole selection rule basically tells us that the overall parity of the ion plus photoelectron wave function that we produce must be ungerade. So that basically means that not all four terms are accessible to us here. And specifically, it's the C1 term and the C3 term that re represent here gerade states that we cannot reach in single photon ionization. Now, what happens if we set C1 and C3 equal to zero? Then we basically see that I left becomes equal to I right. We, we lose the ability to uh, uh, introduce a difference between left and right. We cannot produce electron localization, laboratory frame electron localization in single photon ionization. And so basically what we see here is that the entanglement of the ion with the photoelectron prevents that in XUV ionization, we form the molecular ion in a coherent superposition of uh, 1s sigma g and 2p sigma u. And that is what's needed for electron localization. So autosecond ionization by itself cannot produce electron localization. So how then uh, does it come about that in the experiment we do in fact see electron localization. Well, of course, the experiment is a pump probe experiment. It doesn't just consist of the auto second ionization. There is also an IR probe laser. And what I will try to show to you now is that it is, in fact, this probe laser that converts the entanglement that we have in the initial ion plus photoelectron state into coherence in the ion, into a coherent in the, the possibility to observe a coherent superposition of the gerade un, and the ungerade ionic state. Now, how can the IR do this? The IR can do this in two ways. One thing that the IR can do is that it can interact with the uh, molecular ion. It can pump the molecule from the, from the ground state to the excited state, or conversely, by stimulated emission, uh, we can <clears throat> come down from the 2p sigma u state to the 1s sigma g. And so basically, the, the IR can interconvert uh, the 1s sigma g and the 2p sigma u, and that is a way to get non-zero amplitudes uh, for the C1 and C3. And the moment that we do that, as we saw on the previous slide, we have the ability to see an electron localization. Uh, interestingly, there is a second way that the IR laser can do this, in the sense that the IR laser can also interact with the outgoing photoelectron. That IR lasers do this very efficiently is something that, of course, we know. Uh, we use it in streaking experiments. We use it in uh, uh, rabbit uh, type uh, experiments. And that basically means that the IR laser can change the angular momentum of the outgoing photoelectron that is entangled with the ion. And that also is a way to create coherence in the molecular ion. And in the analysis of the experiment that we did, <clears throat> like I said, about 10 years ago, uh, we could convince ourselves that in fact, both of these mechanisms uh, played a role, although at the time we were a little bit nervous about using the word entanglement in this, in this context. Um, yeah, but that's basically the conclusion of this work, is that the IR probe laser converts the very high degree of entanglement that we have in the initial ion plus photoelectron state that prevents us from having coherence in the ion, that therefore prevents us from having electron uh, localization. The IR laser converts this entanglement, and as a result of that, we get a coherence in the ion, we get an observed electron localization. Okay, so this was an example of the way that entanglement 
is involved in determining the degree of electronic coherence in a molecular ion. What I now would like to turn to is uh, the role that entanglement plays in vibrational coherence. I mean, the moment that we ionize an H2 molecule with an after second pulse, uh, as I've said, among the possibilities that we have is producing the uh, bound uh, ground state of the molecular ion. And in this bound ground state, actually, we will populate a superposition, a coherent superposition of vibrational states. And that basically means that we will form a vibrational wave packet. Now, as you see in this experimental result, this vibrational wave packet is very easy to detect in the sense that we have a situation where if the vibrational wave packet is at the outer turning point, then it's very easy to dissociate the molecular ion by a single photon absorption from the 1s sigma g to the 2p sigma u state. On the other hand, if the vibrational wave packet is at the inner turning point, this takes many photons and is very inefficient. And so simply monitoring the intensity of H pluses as a function of XUV IR pump probe delay uh, maps out this vibrational wave packet motion and we see the dephasing and rephasing uh, that is, uh, has been seen in many, many of these types of experiments. Also, we can take a Fourier transform uh, and then uh, what we recognize is that all the frequencies that we encounter in the experiment are simply the result of quantum beats that we have between adjacent vibrational levels as again, as we expect for this type of uh, experiment. Now, what I want to do in, on, in the next part of my talk is take this one step further uh, and basically show you the results of a numerical experiment where I've done calculations on this vibrational wave packet dynamics, but now with a sequence of two attosecond pulses, where I induce a, a variable time delay between these two attosecond pulses. This is something that we are beginning to do uh, in the laboratory and that uh, in general with higher monarch sources, people have already been able to, uh, to do. And what I'm going to try and show you is that this provides a way to more or less coherently control the degree of entanglement and or conversely the degree of ionic vibrational coherence that we get in our system. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to propagate the two -dimensional a two-dimensional Schrodinger equation for the uh, H2 molecule. We're going to assume that the H2 molecule is aligned along the laser polarization axis. And we're going to assume that one electron is going to remain bound and we're going to make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation putting this electron uh, either in the configuration for the 1s sigma g or the 2p sigma u state. And then what we do is a 2D uh, calculation, calculation with two degrees of freedom, one degree of freedom for the internuclear coordinate, uh, the vibrational or the dissociative coordinate, and one uh, degree of freedom for the second electron, which is free to move along the laser polarization axis. And that is in fact the, the electron that is going to be ionized by the other second laser pole. Um, and then what we do in the calculation is determine the joint energy spectrum of the photoelectrons that are produced by the XUV pulse and the fragment ions that are produced by the propulse. Uh, and I've done this using the time-dependent uh, surface flux method. Uh, so on this occasion, I would say a, a big thank you to uh, Lars Matson and Dieter Bauer, who a few, papers, who a few years ago uh, written some very nice, beautiful papers about uh, the implementation of this method for uh, hydrogen. Uh, and I've uh, benefited greatly from that uh, when doing this work. Um, <clears throat> okay, so a few numerical details. The results that I'm going to show you are results where I have an auto second pulse that is centered around 0.8 atomic units, so about 22 electron volts. Uh, and I'm going to probe the vibrational wave packet with a probe laser that has a photon energy of 0.1 atomic unit, so about 3 eV, roughly 400 nanometers. A few details about the uh, electron and the ion grid. Of course, the nice thing about this T-surf method is that it allows propagation uh, over uh, 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 very uh, large times uh, at, a, at a very modest cost, uh, given that beyond a certain uh, electron radius and beyond a certain internuclear uh, uh, distance, uh, the wave functions are projected onto Volkov states and plane waves and makes the whole uh, propagation very, very efficient. Um, okay, so here I show you a few results of these calculations. So here I show you three results. So three pump probe scans, uh, where, where we look at the H plus kinetic energy distribution, or here it's plotted as momentum distribution, as a function of XUV IR pump probe delay. And for the XUV pulse, we actually have a pair of pulses with a delay here of zero atomic units, 450 atomic units, about 10, 12 femtoseconds, and 900 atomic units, about 20, 22 uh, atomic units. 
So basically for a delay of zero atomic units, a single isolated at the second pulse, we see a vibrational wave packet motion very similar to what we saw in the experimental result a moment ago. We see the dephasing, rephasing, it basically looks very similar to the experimental result. Uh, the same can be said for the result that we get with an XUV, XUV delay of uh, 900 atomic units. Looks very, very similar to what we have at zero delay, but we have a very different situation when we have an XUV, XUV delay of 450 atomic units, about uh, 10 femtoseconds. In this case, we don't really see the fundamental vibrational frequency anymore. We do see some high frequency oscillations, but uh, uh, much less pronounced than in the other two cases. And what I'm going to try to convince you of right now is that this is a result of photoelectron ion entanglement. And so basically entanglement between the electron and the ion that prevents the emergence of a pronounced uh, coherence in the uh, vibrational wave function of the ion. Um, so how will, how will I demonstrate this to you? Well, first off, uh, when you have such a time dependent trace, of course, it's useful to, uh, uh, to perform a Fourier transformation to see which frequency, uh, frequencies underlie the time dependent trace. And on my next slide, I'm going to do that for these three traces, as well as uh, uh, a lot of additional delays between the XUV, XUV pulse. And so basically what you, uh, and I'm going to do that at the energy that is given, indicated here, uh, by the uh, by the yellow line, so basically for a proton momentum of about 10 atomic units. Okay, so that leads to this graph here. And so here we see basically we see the frequency content of these vibrational wave packets as a function of the two pulse delay, as a function of the delay between the two isolated other second pulses that I've used to ionize uh, the molecule and to initiate this wave packet motion. Um, <clears throat> the frequencies near 0 0.007 are the fundamental frequencies, and so basically the frequencies corresponding to uh, adjacent vibrational level spacing. Uh, to some extent, we also see <clears throat> uh, double the frequencies. Those basically are coherences between vibrational uh, states that uh, are separated by, uh, by two quanta. Um, when we look at the fundamental frequencies, then we uh, recognize the behavior that we saw in the initial, uh, in, in these initial traces that I showed a moment ago. And so we, we see pronounced fundamental frequencies for uh, zero delay, also for 900 atomic units delay, uh, and a near absence of these vibrational frequencies when the delay between the two upper second pulses is about 450 uh, uh, atomic units. And my claim is that the fact that we see these frequencies very pronounced at these uh, delays of 900 or so double 1800 uh, atomic units uh, reflects the fact that here we have a high degree of coherence in the ionic wave function, whereas uh, at the other delays uh, we have introduced a high degree of photoelectron ion entanglement that prevents this vibrational coherence. Now, and in order to prove to you or try to prove to you that this is the case, I would like you to look at this diagram here where I've um, <clears throat> where I'm considering the uh, ionization uh, of an atomic or molecular system into two uh, final ionic states, so for example, two of my vibrational uh, states in the H2 plus system, and I'm uh, considering this for different time delays between the two outer second pulses that I use to ion. So there's two delays that I'm showing. Uh, one, the delay on the left is where, where the delay is equal to two pi divided by the energy difference between the two states that I'm considering. The delay on the right that I'm considering is basically half of that, is pi divided by uh, the energy difference between the two states that I'm considering. Now, obviously, when I have a delay between, between two pulses, uh, I, in, I induce uh, fringes in my XUV spectrum. Uh, <clears throat> in the case on the left side, these fringes uh, basically have an energy spacing that is equal to the, the spacing between the two levels that I have assumed. In the case on the right, at half the delay, uh, the spacing between these fringes is twice that, is twice the energy difference between my states. And now let's turn our attention to the graphs at the bottom, which basically are photoelectron spectra that we expect to be able to measure the moment that we ionize our system with these pulses, with these uh, XUV spectra, uh, and basically with uh, red and black labeling whether we are ionizing into the E1 or the E2 final state that I have assumed. Um, so first, let's, uh, let's look at the case on the right. I hope you can see my, uh, my cursor here. Um, and what we see there is that if I measure a photoelectron energy at this energy here that I'm currently indicated, indicating, oops, 
I don't see much. Yeah. And so basically at the peak of the of one of these uh, red oscillations, then you see that at that energy, the probability, uh, I mean, to measure a photoelectron in coincidence with uh, the, the other state, uh, the E1 state, is virtually zero. In other words, the moment that I measure a photoelectron at this energy, it essentially tells me that I have produced state E2. In other words, at that point, there's no uncertainty anymore about whether I've produced E1 or E2, and there is no vibrational coherence. Likewise, uh, if I uh, produce a photoelectron at this energy here, I'm now pointing at one of the, the peaks in the black curve, uh, then I know with a very high degree of probability that I've produced state E1, uh, and that uh, state E2 has not been uh, formed. In other words, again, uh, there is no vibrational coherence in this case. And so this is basically a case where there's a very high degree of entanglement between the photoelectron and the ion. Uh, if I choose to do a measurement on the photoelectron, determine its kinetic energy, then it pretty much tells me what ionic state I have uh, formed. And in that sense, I do not have a vibrational wave effect. Now, the situation is very different on the left. Uh, on the left, <coughs> uh, so where, where the fringes that I have in the XUV spectrum are equal to the energy difference between these two states, there we have a situation where the two photoelectron spectra look very, very similar to each other. I mean, one is just shifted by the energy spacing between the two states with respect to each other. Uh, but basically here we have a situation that even if I were to measure the energy of the photoelectron, it really doesn't tell me whether I formed state E1 and E2. So this is a case where I have a low degree of entanglement. Uh, and as a result of that, I have a high degree of vibrational coherence in my system. And so this basically underlies what we saw in this graph here. As a function of time delay, we induce fringes in the XUV spectrum, and these fringes either lead to a high degree of entanglement between the ion and the photoelectron. In this case, I will not see a vibrational wave packet, or they lead to a low degree of entanglement between the ion and the photoelectron. And in this case, I can measure uh, an ionic vibrational wave packet with a high degree of coherence. Okay, so that's the main message of my talk. I briefly want, at the end, want to show you that we are now also uh, beginning to try and do these things in the laboratory. And so in the laboratory, uh, obviously, if, we, if we're looking at entanglement between ions and photoelectrons, then we would like to be able to measure these in coincidence. Now, this is basically where my talk then continues to talk of Robert Mosheimer yesterday. Uh, I mean, the method of choice there obviously is, is going to be then the Coltrane's uh, uh, method. And in order to do that, as Robert also explained yesterday, we need high repetition rate in our experiment. Now, in order to do that at MBI, we've developed a 100 kilohertz attosecond experiment. So we've built a 100 kilohertz uh, non-collinear optical parametric amplifier that generates uh, something like seven femtosecond pulses, few hundred microjoules, so quite comparable to what we uh, commonly get out of a holocore fiber compressor when we use a tie sapphire uh, system. Uh, we have, in fact, further compressed these pulses uh, using multiple plate continuum generation, also using a holocore fiber compressor, and there we get near single cycle uh, uh, operation, so that's already very good for isolated autosecond pulse generation. Uh, of course, if we want to generate isolated autosecond pulses, then carry envelope phase control is very important, and uh, we have confirmed the carry envelope phase stability of our uh, system. Uh, so here you see results of an experiment that we've done together with the group of Gerhard Paulus, uh, where we've done a single shot, every shot uh, CEP measurement of the, of the system. Uh, and the CEP quality that we have here is really fully compatible with uh, uh, reproducible isolated autosecond pulse uh, production. Uh, recently, we have confirmed the isolated autosecond pulse production. So here you see a, a streaking trace that we have recorded. This is not yet recorded with the Coltrams uh, uh, apparatus. In this case, we hooked up a velocity map imaging spectrometer to the setup. Here you see the measured uh, streaking trace. And here you see a retrieval. This is a retrieval using the, the Volkov transform generalized projection algorithm that was developed by Franz Kertner and co-workers. Uh, the important thing about this <coughs> algorithm is that it doesn't make the central momentum uh, approximation. And that is very important to us because many of the photoelectrons that we detect in this experiment are relatively uh, low energy. And of course, we also detect them over a very large bandwidth. Um, so these are basically the retrieved pulses. And so basically what we see is that we form isolated autosecond pulses with a duration of uh, more or less 150, 100, 
140, 150 uh, attoseconds, there's a very nice pre and post pulse uh, contrast. Uh, pre and post pulses are, are well below a percent. Uh, so this is really a quite uh, high quality source of isolated attosecond pulses. It's also a relatively efficient source. We generate at least something like 10 to the six photons per pulse. And that is really compatible with uh, doing cold frames uh, measurements. And in fact, at the moment, we are beginning to do these measurements. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk. So my summary, uh, autosecond experiments rely on the existence of coherent superpositions. Uh, and I've tried to convince you that the coherence that we, had, uh, that we need there is often limited by entanglement. I've shown you that coherent control techniques may allow us to overcome these limitations uh, by tuning uh, the sequences to coherences of interest. That's something that may be particularly interested interesting when we try to do charge migration experiments, uh, where we try to build coherent superpositions of specific, specific states with specific energy uh, spacings. And I've also very briefly shown you uh, the progress that we are making with the experimental implementation of some of these ideas. Finally, I want to acknowledge uh, Federico Four, Michel Ozolotkov, Tobias Witting, Franz-Peter Schultz, uh, who basically together developed the autosecond experiment that I showed you at the end. And I very much want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. A very interesting uh, uh, presentation. And, uh, and also for the very exciting results. Uh, I'd like now to, to go to the Q&A session and we got um, one question ready from the audience and we have one time for this, also time for this. So Mark, it's a question. It's a question from the uh, Reiner Donner. Mark, I fully agree with your description of entanglement, but a persistent person from quantum optics would claim that to experimentally prove that the system is entangled rather than only classically correlated, one needs to do a belt test. Is there a trick uh, how to do a belt test in these experiments, experimentally rather than only theory? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, a, a very interesting question. Uh, I can tell you that last year, um, I've, I've spent a few months trying to come up with a Bell test uh, in this context. Um, unfortunately, I, I mean, it may be possible, I don't know. Uh, I have not found it yet. I have not found a way yet um, to, to, let's say, map the, the experimental protocol that one would use in a Bell test. Uh, to map that onto, let's say, the experimental capabilities that we have in an autosecond laser lab. It may be possible, but I have not found a way yet. But okay. it would, of course, be ex incredibly exciting if we could do that. Thank you. Uh, the, there are two more questions. Maybe I will allow uh, a couple of minutes to that, even though we're running out of time. The, the Emilio P Pisanti asks that the theory toolbox from quantum information provides several useful measure, measures of entanglement. Have you looked at those measure, measures for the numerical simulations of H2 you presented? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, and uh, I, I totally agree that, that that's a very interesting way to, to, uh, to proceed. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> uh, the project that I'm reporting you on uh, today uh, is still ongoing. Uh, in fact, it's very much made possible by the corona pandemic that gave me a little bit of free time to, to work on this problem that I had wanted to work on uh, for some time already. And, and in fact, what you're suggesting is exactly what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, and, and what I'm finding uh, is indeed that uh, the, the observations that, that I'm making in the simulations that I, that I showed you here today, uh, they are consistent with what you would expect at the moment that you apply these quantum optics principles. And so, for example, one of the things that you can do is determine the purity of the uh, uh, wave function uh, for the different conditions as a, as a function of uh, XUV, XUV pump uh, delay. Uh, and then, in fact, you, you see pronounced oscillations in this uh, purity uh, going back and forth between situations where there's a high degree of entanglement uh, and situations where there's a high degree of coherence. So yeah, I very much agree with your question. It's exactly what I'm doing at the moment. Thank, thank you, Mark. There was a comment, so it's not a question. So you don't need to answer is that it's, it's enough to measure proper entanglement 
uh, witness, which should be easier in general than the Bell test from Marcy Levenstein. And uh, Reichard Dörner said, I agree, we also failed. So with this, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Mark again for this exciting presentation.